I'm delighted to be here today to set going a conversation between two wonderful writers. Uh, let me introduce them to you in order on my immediately right. Uh, Marlene van Niekerk is a South African poet, playwright, short story writer, critic, and novelist. Born and raised on a farm in the Western Cape, she studied philosophy at Stellenbosch University, where she now teaches in the Department of uh, Afrikaans and Dutch, and in the Netherlands, where she received the doctorate in philosophy. In between writing her master's and her doctoral thesis, she spent the early 80s in Germany, where she studied directing in the theater. Her published work includes a prize-winning collection of poetry, a collection of short stories entitled The Woman Who'd Forgotten Her Binoculars, two novels, Triomphe and Achat, and the novella Memorandum, which includes paintings from the work of the South African writer, uh, painter uh, Adrian van Siel. Triomphe, her stunning debut novel, explores the lives of working-class Afrikaners on the eve of the first democratic elections in South Africa. It was the first work in Afrikaans to win the Noma Award, the most prestigious right, uh, um, uh, prize in African publishing. And the film adaptation, directed by Michael Rayburn, won the Best South African Film Award at the Durban International Film Festival in 2008. Ahat, which we'll talk about today, won the Sunday Times Literary Prize and the Herzog Prize, and the English translation by Michael Haynes, which is the only access to it that I have, and which I enjoyed very much, won the first uh, Sol Glatier Prize for translation. Um, it sometimes seems otios to introduce someone, but anyway, Tony Morrison is the author of nine novels, which have appeared every few years since her own 1970 stunning debut novel, The Bluest Eye. She's also published children's books with her son and the experimental short story Recitative. And she's the author of the play Dreaming Emmett and the libretto Margaret Garner, and of a number of works of nonfiction reflecting on literature and on contemporary American life. Born in Lorraine, Ohio, she was educated at Howard University and Cornell University, where she took degrees in English literature. In the 1960s, as an editor at Random House, she was a key figure in introducing American readers to African American and, relevantly today, to African writing. Since The Bluest Eye, she's published the novels Sula, Song of Solomon, Tar Baby, Beloved, Jazz, Paradise, Love, and last year, A Mercy. Among the many awards Toni Morrison has received for her fiction are a Pulitzer Prize and the American Book Award for her 1987 Beloved, which in 2006, the New York Times Book Review, after polling extensively among writers and critics, named the best American novel published in the last 25 years. Your spirit may resist that sort of assessment, but in fact, they were right. In 1996, Ms. Morrison received the National Book Foundation's Medal of Distinguished Contribution to American Letters. And in 2008, we at Penn gave her the Penn Borders Literary Service Award, which, and I quote, honors a distinguished American writer whose critically acclaimed work helps us to understand the human condition in original and powerful ways. Oh, and, and by the way, in 1993, she won the Nobel Prize. Thank you. Uh, so, welcome to you both. I hope your microphones work more successfully than mine. Um, so, one of the main aims of our festival is to widen the audience for writing from outside the United States and in languages uh, other than English. So, for those of you who haven't read it yet, um, Ahat, and the author will pronounce the name correctly uh, at some point in this conversation, explores the relationship over about four decades between an Africana woman, Mila Devet, and her caretaker, the young colored woman, Aghat, viewed backwards through the reflections of the older white woman who was dying of ALS in the 1990s. Mrs. DeWet has been reduced to the stage where she can only communicate with gestures of her eyes. So we see life through the diaries that she's written since before Aghat entered her life, and in a narrative voice that speaks in the, present, in the second person so that it seems to offer Miller a view of her own life. So, Tony, you have a, a very generous quote on the cover of the American edition of this book. Uh, what would you say to your less cosmopolitan fellow citizens uh, about, why, about uh, why they should read it? <laughs> oh, uh, How are we doing? Is it, is it on? 
Yeah, a little light. Oh, good. There you are. Try again. Did you hear that? Let's try this. Let's try this. Okay, there. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, let's use these. These are good. As it messes up my dress. Good. All right. Um, I uh, was not in a reading mood at all when I received this uh, book. Um, and the editor, I guess, or the publisher who sent it, the salesperson said something about this book would mesmerize me. And it was a big fat book. And I thought, I don't want to read anything. I just gotten out of the hospital or went in or something. I had a horrible hip problem. <clears throat> and they took it out and gave me another one. <laughs> But, you know, it's like, you know, you can't do anything but read U.S. Weekly or something. But I opened this book, and I was totally taken by it, instantly. I wasn't sure who was speaking in the first few lines. Um, I really appreciated the sensibility of that, whoever it was who was speaking. And it became, for me, this journey intense. I mean, I read this book. It, it took me two days, I have to tell you. Um, but I read it, what we would call reading through. I found it so beautifully written, so interesting in its architecture where meaning really lies. And it was powerful and fully imagined, fully and completely imagined. Now, those are all, you know, lit crit terms, I know. But, <laughs> but there's this amazing, Tony just described it, a situation where you have a woman who is dying and cannot move, and cannot speak. Eventually, she can't, and her eyes are closed. She can't move any of her muscles. And she's totally dependent on a um, black woman whom she rescued as a child, a thrown away child, a castaway child, and trained her to become what she is, which is a very competent, very loyal servant, but who also has her own um, mind and uh, uh, manipulative strategies, <laughs> which she learned from the mistress. I know I'm going on and on, but anyway. That's, the, that's the, the, the place. The rest of it is how we get the information that puts us at that point. How we learn where she came from, the white South African woman, what her desires are, who was this little girl, Agat, and uh, how did she become this way, and then all of the other things in the community and the family. It's absolutely the most extraordinary book that I've read in a long, long time. You must read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that, that seems like a moment at which we should give you your voice. <laughs> um, tell us a bit more about this. I mean, you, this is your second novel. Yes, I first want to say that I'm totally overcome listening here to uh, all those glowing uh, words and it coming from a reader and a writer like you, I really, really appreciate it so much. Thank you. So this is, this is a second Yes, this novel. is a second it's, novel. It's one thing that's fascinating for me about it, it's, it's very different from your first novel, not in that it's, of course, it's also your first novel is a work of great craft mm -hmm. as well, but it's, it's a completely different setting, it's a completely different um, sort of it's, it's, uh, it's rural rather than urban, it's solid sort of burger rather than working class. I mean, everything about it is, is different. So you've, you've imagined two worlds. They can't both possibly be yours. Nobody could have come from both those places. <laughs> is, is, this, is, this a, is this more like the place you came from than Triomphe? It probably is, but um, not entirely either. Um, 
there's a long answer and a short one to this. I we could, have time. I could, I could say that I think most people think the books are very different. But I think um, the books are two different forms of camouflage of the same story, mm -hmm. which is a family story. You would have noticed that there are four members in this family, whether they're low-class white trash or whether they are educated burghers with quite a bit of personal narcissism to look after. And then you have in both families the backroom children. Yeah. And uh, both of them live on the margins of their families. They've learned their dirty tricks within the families. And in the back rooms, they uh, do some magic stuff. Mm -hmm. But they can't entirely liberate themselves from the families either. They're caught in that. I don't know. Uh, when I saw this pattern, which I didn't know when I started writing a heart, I thought, oh, oh, how am I ever going to get rid of them? <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, uh, both books were received rather uh, with, with, with a bit of animosity from the Afrikaans readers, because in the first case, dealing with a white trash Afrikaner family, people felt uh, 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 somehow let down. Um, by a fellow Afrikaans-speaking person to portray Afrikaans people like that. And in the second case, quite high and mighty professors at the university <laughs> told me, why did you have to give away our soil? <laughs> give away our soil to a heart. Which I think is just one of those funny things that's happening these days <laughs> that uh, professors believe when you write about uh, a farm being inherited by a colored person, you actually want to give soil away. <laughs> this is South Africa. <laughs> so it's, it's natural, of course, for us outside anyway, and maybe it's natural for South Africans too, to read this as an allegory of your nation's history. Well, of course, when one uh, writes a novel, you try to make it as thick as possible and to make it readable on different levels. So obviously, you know, I took great care to line up the dates in a certain way so that it could also be an allegory of uh, uh, our country. And uh, on the other hand, it's only one, I think, of the mobilizing Sorry. forces in the, in the novel. As far as I'm concerned, stories about mothers and daughters. I wanted to ask you something about uh, this novel, which is, I read an interview you gave in which you suggested that the woman, uh, Miller, was, I don't know if you said vampire, but you said <laughs> she sucks yeah. other, the blood and she's lustful that way and manipulative that way and controlling that way. Now, when I read it the first time, I was, because she's generally the one who speaks, I mean, it's to her so she knows her story from her point of view. But I didn't, I felt that she was wrong in many instances, overbearing in a few, but I didn't get that feeling until I read that interview that she was really almost duplicating in a way the control and the real meanness of her own mother with her. So when she takes this child and just reforms her and re tries to, and she even uses the word slave a couple of times. No in the text. Uh, and and the, beaut the magnificent thing, which is sort of understated until sort of the end, is how Achat resists while looking, while working with her, you know. It's as though she's loyal because that's who she is. Not necessarily because the woman deserves it. It's just that that's who she is. It's really, um, it bears another reading, which I've given it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Might deserve a third. But it's really very complicated, very interesting. But you uh, still hold that position that she is a little, not quite evil, but... As, <laughs> yeah, as far as one can hold a position on one's own work, I mean, one speaks very differently when one speaks about the work, as yes. you would know when you sit there in the heat of the moment <laughs> uh, trying to make something else but yourself and your opinions speak or whatever right from somewhere, you know. But um, uh, I think we, we have a saying that comes from the Bible, the sins of the fathers will be transplanted from generation to generation until the third and the fourth generation. And I think Mila uh, was really treated badly by her mother and the only way which, which she knew 
was to subject the little Achat to a whole set of mores, mm -hmm. to a language. Mm -hmm. But you see, these things are always ambivalent. But I think Mela is uh, truly a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, I think if people fall for her, yeah. self-excusing, self-justificatory wiles, yeah. then I have succeeded. I'm, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I make her a little bit better, I think, when she's dead and dying and can't speak than when she is young and full of designs. Mm, mm. But I think on the, on the scale of evil, I think she, she weighs in much, much heavier than the wife beater of her husband, Yak. Yeah, I was about to ask you, every time he slaps her every now and then, and I go, ooh, wife beater, horrible. Yeah. And he's, you know, the typical. Yeah. But then on the second time, I thought, I don't know what she did to make him slap her, <laughs> but every now and then, you want to clip her a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think she did. <laughs> I, I think she did quite a lot to provoke those uh, yes, yes, those yes. behaviors of his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, 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 she took, she, she gored him. She took his gut. She did. She's a vampire. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the, 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 these are the things one one doesn't um, spout too much in the text. One one hides one's own sure. one's own. Uh, Aversions. Yeah, you, yeah, you bear witness to, yeah. in the text, and your own, you know, idea of them is uh, camouflaged, as yeah. you say. It has yeah. to be. Yeah. Otherwise, you're writing another kind of literature. I mean, in Beloved, you have the same thing explaining the ambiguity of Seth's actions mm -hmm. and uh, uncompromisable. <laughs> aspects of her, of her actions. And you have the reader thinking this and that, thinking with the neighbors and also understanding exactly what the love is Poor that loves Sata, too much. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Poor Sata, yes. poor thing. Yeah, yeah. Until, you know, someone yeah. says, well, you got two feet. <laughs> <laughs> Not four. Four, four feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Do you think that, uh, I mean, one of the things, again, Novels get read differently in different places, and we're reading yes. your South African novel from outside. But um, there's something slightly terrifying, really, to me anyway, about the image of, rela of relations between men and women that comes not just out of the central uh, heterosexual relationship in the novel, but more generally out of the sense of a world of, there are sort of worlds of men and worlds of women, and, and not a lot of real understanding, maybe a little more understanding by the women of the men, but, but yes. even there, it seems, you, you don't have a lot of hope for that. Is that, um, uh, is, it a, is that a fair response, you think, to the world of the novel? Yes, I do think so. I think South African politics, also gender politics, um, is, the, it's quite a harsh world with um, extreme torsions of power, and I'm quoting Kutsia now, of course, also in the field and the arena of gender. And I think I wouldn't have been able to see it so, so, uh, so clearly if not for my own position, which is ever so slightly outside the, the main arena, mm -hmm. you know, being a, a lesbian woman, mm -hmm. um, I, I somehow seem to have, uh, uh, I think, understood or be able to see more uh, of the way in, in which the dressage of women uh, works and uh, the dumbness of men is fed <laughs> by that and mm -hmm. uh, actually upheld by it and in which the people can't grow also in intimate relationships. But, but one, of the, one of the consequences, at least in the novel, of this is that uh, relations between men of different generations are also terrible, yes. basically, yes. in this novel. Fathers and sons. I mean, yes. uh, of course, the relation, if, to the extent that a heart is a kind of child of Miller, a kind of yes. child substitute, that's not a perfect relationship either, but there is real love and, yes, uh, there is. and uh, yeah. sympathy and understanding as but well as there's that wonderful relationship um, between her and young Jackie. Yes. And that young man who leaves and just doesn't understand what is this country yes. and gets out, but still, you know, uses the lore and the folklore and the, yeah. you know, um, history of uh, South Africa as part of his work. 
So it's not that he has total contempt. No. He just can't live in that environment. And part of it may be due, I'm not, I don't remember exactly, but I do remember he was specifically and undeniably reared by uh, Agat. Yes. She, 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 she taught she, him yeah. everything. Yeah. And when he goes, he takes the two things. <laughs> The ram's horn. That's and, right, the ram's horn. And the, what do you call it? The blast bulk? What's that in English? The fire? Uh, the uh, blowers. Um, what? Uh, for the fireplace? The thing for starting a fire. Oh, yeah, Bellows, yeah. thank you very much. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Anyhow, and those are the two things. Yes. Yeah. Sound yeah. and yeah. bris and fire. Yeah. And that's what he yeah. takes, and that is yeah, what he yeah. takes from her. Yeah. yeah. So, so the... So the, the yeah. The best relationship in the book, this is a horrible way to put it, but the best relationship is this amazing relationship between the young white child and yes. his, this woman who's sort of his mother and thought of his sister and, and sort of his servant. Yes, and, and his, his nanny. His nanny. Yeah, and uh, you see that touches on a very important aspect, I think, of South African life. Many of us knew nannies when we were small. And mm. um, I think many young children, young white children, from the early days of the slaves in, mm -hmm. Cape, in the Cape, uh, first feelings of attachment, mm -hmm. uh, often being suckled by slave mm -hmm. women. Um, a heart mm -hmm. also starts mm -hmm. to lactate uh, mm -hmm. through her closeness mm -hmm. with him. Mm -hmm. And even the eroticizing of the baby's body, that mm -hmm. happens through the nanny. Sure, sure, so sure. the attachment patterns mm -hmm. are often very much influenced by these first, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. first wet nurses. You know, I've always thought that um, uh, there are certain major moments in a person's life that are significant, turning point. Psychiatrists identify the first time you realize you were a boy or a girl or both or neither or what, or this was your parent. <clears throat> I always thought that in some instances there's a moment when a young child particularly in the United States and in the South and in those days, realize that he or she was white. And if they had a nanny or a nurse, such as the one you describe, and most of them did, they are then told, generally just before puberty, you can't love that person. So the first love they ever had that was free and open and beautifully equally exchanged with all, is they're now told that was a bad thing you did. This person is someone you have to control or manipulate exactly. so on. Yeah. That does not happen with no. Jack. He keeps, no. he keeps the yeah. feeling. I yeah. think he's a bit scared of her later and he sees <laughs> what she's capable of because she's going to keep the shrine of her mistress alive. That's I don't know true. whether she's going to, you know, ever exit from the melancholia of that process of mourning the person who yeah. shaped her yeah. and who determined her fate. But there's, there's only one little um, reference to something interesting or sexual or erotic, and that is when Yaki, is a reference to Yaki teaching a heart how to dance in the back room. Oh, yes. Just a tiny Just reference. <laughs> But, um, I mean, I had to cut out about 300 pages of this book. Oh, no. <laughs> so, as you what know. What is it now? Eight, 800 pages? <laughs> exactly. I they want those 300 pages. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I mean, that, that back room was also yes. the laboratory where Lucky, uh, Yucky's um, sensibilities, That's I think, right. were shaped. Uh, the and sounds and the songs. And you, and the and you end with that story. Yeah. yeah. That we sort of get, but at the end she, she told him every night there was a woman once who, yes. <laughs> and, the, and their, their initial meeting, and every word he memorized, and when she was, you know, when she missed a phrase, he would correct her. That's a really, really beautiful relationship, and it, you know, whatever their origins and their different motives, there's a kind of um, a beautiful, uh, Freedom and dignity in both of those people, yeah. in Arat as well as Jackie. Yeah, Jackie, you know? yeah. Jackie should we call him? Uh, but he's gone. He's gone. He's in Canada. He's in Canada, by the way. <laughs> uh, 
uh, because he's had this experience that many young South Africans had in that period of being involved in the war in um, southwest Africa and in what's now Namibia and in Angola. And um, he's a very successful fighter pilot mm -hmm. or bomber or something. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, he, uh, and he wins medals. And he realizes at a certain point that he's doing something that he ought not to be doing. And, so, and the only way he can deal with that is to leave and go into exile. And so uh, at, at the end of the book, at the time of his mother's death, he returns because the politics have changed and he can mm -hmm, return. Mm -hmm. But he's got a life elsewhere. And one of the, again, one of the very sad things, I think, in the novel, and I'm empathizing with all these characters madly, <laughs> is, that, um, is that you feel that it would have been so interesting to see what their relationship could have been like if they'd been living closer together, if they'd had the Wait, You mean? Jackie and, uh, and, and Ahat. Ah. The, the, because yeah. he hasn't really, I mean, he's yeah. been writing her these amazing yeah. letters. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, But they haven't been living in the same world. No. They've been living in very different worlds. She doesn't really understand the world that he's living in, and, it's very, and he's not really in a position to explain it to her. And he knows where she is, and, and knows a huge amount about it because she keeps telling him. But she's sort of been sidelined in his life. Yeah, I had to uh, fantasize, of course, um, what could have been the future of this, this story. You know, Maybe when Yaki's about 60, he will return and say, um, you're organizing the farm now, you've made a success or half a success, doesn't matter, can I come and live again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I come and stay? I don't know. That sounds a little bit romantic, but... Uh, well, what, one of the things we don't uh, really... Because, because Jackie's uh, sort of place in the novel doesn't depend upon our knowing a no. huge amount about his life elsewhere. Yeah. We don't... We know that his life elsewhere, as Tony said, is connected with uh, his appreciation of, yeah. broadly speaking, folklore... Yeah. from his own... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But I think he looks at it like an anthropologist. Yes. Yes. I mean, he's yeah. become a kind of a cosmopolitan, to yes. use your mm -hmm. word. Yes. Uh, I don't know to what extent still rooted, but um, recognizing things uh, as from the basis of being primed by, having been primed by a heart. I mean, she shaped his ears. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> I don't think he would have been a scientist without having his ears... Uh, shaped by, right. by his nanny. Right, because he's an ethnomusicologist, so he's, yeah. uh, he's able to yeah. draw on things. And presumably some of that comes from the fact that his mother is also musically gifted, his, his biological mother. Yes, but she's mm -hmm. a snob. She likes she, only German leader. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> German leader, right? <laughs> but listen, I meant to say, you know, God, God uh, is always praying and singing sermons and memorizing them, and she even has a little revival of the workers in back of the house. But I had the distinct impression that she has no interest in religion at all. It's just what one does and how one uses it. It's, it could be embroidery or something, yes. you know, as far as, she, am I right about that? She doesn't. Just repeat it again. Sorry, I missed. That she's not a true believer in, in the religion. religion. She's always oh, praying yeah. and singing sermons. N and no, she's not a true believer at all. No. But, but I think but she, she uses biblical things yes. constantly. No, she made her own brew of whatever it is. <laughs> she, and she uses it. Yeah. yeah. yeah no, no, yeah. She, uh, I, don't, I don't think she's a believer yeah. except in her own truth. In her own And self, she created yeah. some rituals for herself. Yeah. She can run that farm, though, can't she? <laughs> Well, I don't know. Somebody one, once asked me, what would the farm be like once a heart rules it? Yeah. And I wonder about that. I think she will be quite a tyrant. I wonder how well, her relationship, would, how her yeah, relationship yeah. With, the, with the workers would... But technically would be. she would know everything. Now, technically she would, but I don't know about her human yeah, relationships. Her relationships, yes, yeah. you're and, right. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ways in which her attitude to the universe, let's say, shows up is in these strange moments when she's out there uh, in the hills yes. and Miller can see her sometimes yes. doing these yeah. things. What's she doing with her and hands? And I could never quite figure out what, <laughs> what all that was what about. The <laughs> now what, what happens is that when she's small, Miller teaches her a, a little dance that's called greeting the sun in order to correct her posture. And when, uh. once she gets 
demote it to the backyard, mm -hmm. to the nanny's room. Yeah. She appropriates this dance and makes it into another thing. It's ah. not a pretty dance anymore. It is a ritual exercising, stamp-footing kind of angry right, right. thing that she yeah. does to ah. give herself some power Very good. in the hills, yeah. I think. I think it's that. Very good. Yeah, uh, Anyhow, uh, so you, you, I, I wondered. I mean, so uh, I think we've given you enough reason yes. to read to read the book if you haven't. Um, we, we we certainly enjoyed it very very much, and um, c clearly uh, you're you're committed to it. Um, I wondered if we could turn a little bit now to talking about the your situation, as it were, as a writer. We we talked a little bit about your sense of being a little bit outside the sort of uh, the, the center of Africana life. But, um, but Afrikaans itself as a language, and it's the language you write in, uh, is placed a little bit strangely, even though it's called Afrikaans, it's placed a little bit strangely in Africa itself. One of, one of the things that I found interesting in the novel is the way in which, again, for an outsider, it's striking that um, the people's racial positions are so taken for granted that if you're an outsider, it takes you a while to figure out who's <laughs> white and who's yeah. colored and who's black. Yeah. I mean, yeah. because uh, in that world, everybody knows who they are. Who they are. Um, but of course, Afrikaans is, is the language of the, the, the group that created uh, apartheid. Um, it's, a, it's one of the 11 official languages of South Africa now, but it, it clearly has a, and it's also, one should insist, of course, a language which is spoken by as many non-white people as, as white mm. people. It's not a white person's language. Um, but it does have these associations. And I'm wondering what it's like, especially because you're a poet too. You've published uh, two, I think, collections of poetry, and one of them is a prize-winning collection. Uh, perhaps they both are. Um, uh, but what's it like for you? I mean, does that matter to you that you're writing in this language that has this funny political place yes, in course. the world, not just in your own country? Yes, of course. Um, I talked previously about uh, a sense of complicity, having been brought up as a privileged white person in a privileged place, and um, having the benefit of that, I mean, sitting here today, is <laughs> to a certain extent because of the way I've been educated and had certain privileges. Right. So one is complicitous to the bone, but then how do you work with it? What do you do with it when you write? Mm -hmm. You can't help it, like all of us. I mean, you're born in a place, in a certain place, with a certain color, with a certain language that you learn at your mother's knee. Um, there's a long answer to that as well. Um, Afrikaans grew into a fully developed language in rather doubtful circumstances, <laughs> as you well know. Mm. But now it is developed, and it has organized for itself a literature that is at the moment um, strangely and maybe surprisingly quite vibrant. And um, one hopes for a lot of its finer qualities, the language's finer abilities to be developed even mm. more. Um, I must also say that recently I attended a musical by young so-called colored people from the Cape called Afrikaans. Yes. yes, Afrikaans meaning the type of Afrikaans we speak on the flats. And it was a wonderfully inspiring uh, show of young uh, colored people that is not black, but from, descended from the sun and the Khoisan people together with the slaves that came to the Cape. How they appropriated this language as their language and the way they spoke it, and how they, uh, how they in, uh, made up or constructed the narrative of Dutch at the Cape, and um, how the, those early slaves appropriated Dutch and changed it and wrote it down in Arabic script, mm -hmm. yeah. phonetically in Arabic script. And if you read the Van Riebeek Association's um, uh, um, uh, transcriptions of court roles, you will find those very first slaves for the first time using certain grammatical structures of Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. So these young guys took that entire history and showed it with song and dance and said, we will, we will make art in this form, in this dialect of Afrikaans. So what I'm saying is that I think 
Afrikaans has a huge footing in the South African populace, and it's not only amongst white people. You have, a, as it happens, a PhD in philosophy from a Dutch university. It's not a PhD, it's, a it's one of those things you call a DRS. DRS. Yeah. Whatever. It's not a PhD. Okay. It's below a PhD. Um, uh, in my family, most people think, seem to think there's nothing below a PhD. But, um, uh, uh, Anyhow, so, yes. But, yeah. but, so yeah. you've, lived, you've, lived with, you've lived with Dutch yes. as it has developed in the Netherlands as well as with Afrikaans. I'm curious as to how you think modern Afrikaans sounds to a Dutch speaker because one of the great questions about uh, literature in English is how um, African writing in English or Australian writing in English or Indian writing in English sounds to those who speak uh, the, the language the tongue, as, as it's yeah. developed in America or in, mm. or in Britain. I think the Dutch often find it, what's the word, um, undunlik, they, they, they find it um, kind, kind of cute. Cute, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, It's like sort of baby, it, baby talk. <laughs> <laughs> because it has simplified the grammatical structure. Oh. Oh. Semantically, there's about a 60 to 70 percent overlap, but grammatically, it's simplified. Oh. Uh, idiomatically, it is idiosyncratic <laughs> and um, also influenced by the other uh, languages, indigenous languages in South Africa. But I think it's pretty much an indigenous language with a sorry history. And I do think when one writes it, one is aware of the sediment of history in the vocabulary, in certain of the ways of expression, and one tries to account for that. So one has a bit of a, a double task as a writer in Afrikaans. You don't want to lose the tongue. The tongue is under pressure at the moment. Um, the Afrikaans universities are under pressure at the moment. Um, also, you want to acknowledge its history. You don't only want to acknowledge that you are the constructor of the story that you write, but you are also very aware of using a language with a, with a doubtful history. And somehow try to remedy it or help it or lift it up or do something with it to say, you know, although it, it went through this, uh, and it, although sentences were said in it, like those by Jimmy Kruger when Steve Biko died, that laughed my coat, this leaves me cold, mm -hmm. together with the formulation of many of apartheid's worst laws mm -hmm. uh, in Afrikaans. I mean, all of, all of my generation sort of sit with a certain shudder in the veins when we remember what has been said Shattered. in the name yes. of and, yeah. and with yeah. our language. Yeah. So, so, yes, it Do feels you, like a kind of a task. You mm -hmm. can't really penalize language. No, you can't penalize language, but I you mean, see... I mean, people do. I mean, German... I had friends who said, I cannot speak German because... Right. Or, you know... Well, no, it, one has to speak it, but the point is you, you must speak it... With full consciousness of what... Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I wonder whether... I mean, because another thing you did, uh, as I said, when I was introducing you for a period, was work in Germany. Uh, in the 80s. So the question of the relationship of Germans to their own language and history is also a very yeah. big one yeah. there. And yeah. I wonder whether you, there were echoes. Yes, of course it's echoes. Is this thing working? No. Yeah, have this. Hello, it's working now. Um, uh, I once heard, once read uh, uh, an essay by a German critic that said the word spritzen Spritzen is a difficult word in German, in literature, because of the Horst Wessel Lied that referred to Judenblut spritzt. Now, that kind of thing, for instance, you know, that layering in the history of a word, with some of Afrikaans' words, it's also the same. And the layering isn't always necessary. I mean, all words are layered. Certain French words are layered for the same reasons of a colonial or post or, or colonial or pre-colonial or colonial background. Mm -hmm. So so I think um, the weft of Afrikaans you know I think carries in its in its being certain of these layers but also fortunately all kinds of other layers. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, you are uh, you are very um, lucky uh, to have this language I think and uh, and it's very lucky to have you. And we're very lucky that you have a marvelous translator. Yes. Um, and I think 
we might now invite those members of the audience who have uh, questions that they'd Thank like you. to ask each of these writers about each other or about, about um, other topics. There are two microphones up front, and this will work best if you line up behind them and um, uh, to ask your questions. If you're, if you're going to be shy, I have plenty of questions of my own. But uh, does anybody... Good, we got people coming. Uh, good, terrific. Uh, let's start um, on the right, and then we'll okay. oscillate. Um, I wanted to ask Toni Morrison a question on Beloved. Uh, could you just explain a little bit about the symbolism of red, and also if that's why they have a red cover? The symbolism of red? Yeah, and you know, there are lots of symbols. It seems to me. Not orange. <laughs> Baby suck and colors. Pink. <laughs> uh, I, I remember uh, baby sucks lying there, uh, trying to keep interested in life, and that force leaving her because she's dumbfounded by what has happened and cannot decide whether what Setha did was okay or not. And so she begins to think about small things or major things as life leaves, and so she asks for color. Um, there isn't very much in the book. There's the blood in the beginning and um, some recollection of Sweet Home. Uh, and it's beauty. Um, but the book is really sepia. So when she asks for, would she say, bring a little pink if you got any? Is that what she says? Bring me some color pink if you got any. And, you know, even if it's somebody's tongue. Um, but for me, it was a moment as in other books <laughs> where the flash of color is, is theatrical because there's none anywhere else. It's very mm -hmm. sepia, very neutral, you know. And then there are other books like Song of Solomon starts out with red, white, and blue. You know, the most patriotic collection of colors I could think of. So for me, it's just, a, it's not merely, but it is a kind of, visual accommodation um, so that the reader is heightened, uh, the process of reading becomes heightened when you don't have to you know, constantly say that the sky is blue and the grass is green and roses are red. You just, you know, paint it. Hi, uh, my question is about the Nobel Prize. So last time I checked, uh, Professor Morrison, you were the last to win from the United States, so I was just wondering your thoughts on that. Um, we've heard from the Nobel Committee that Americans apparently are too provincial in their <laughs> writing, and thus they can't win it. Uh, Europeans we've seen basically have a, a monopoly on it in the last decade or so, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are, and maybe if you want to tell us which American author should win next. Uh, I don't know, but I don't know. I, I heard that recently that the committee is sort of I, you know, I always thought they sh that uh, the people who really uh, deserve the Nobel Prize for Literature were in this country, uh, not to exclude anybody else, but were the playwrights. I mean, why not Tennessee Williams? I mean, no one has really, or very few people have written better, more interesting plays than American playwrights. And, and they gave one to Dario Fo, I mean, you know, the Italian playwright. So, but that's where I thought they should really look, obviously, in the, you know, the, the major novelists. You know, I wanted everybody to get it, so they would stop harassing me because I got it. <laughs> um, but that's what I, I that, I've always thought that. You know, I know they give to the living, but there were all sorts of people whom I thought 
in the past, uh, particularly among playwrights, Arthur Miller, and I mean, there's just any number of them. Uh, Peter. Thanks. I, I would like to ask about the, your views about the uh, talk about the post-racial society in light of the presidency of Barack Obama. It seems it's sort of nonsense, but and race still matters. And so in what ways race does matter in your view and in your writings? Did everybody get that? So this was a question about uh, uh, what we should feel about, well, actually what Tony thinks about a talk of a post-racial society and w w the, he was, uh, Peter said uh, race clearly does matter, so this sounds like a kind of nonsense, but uh, is there some, some truth to it? And I think we might invite uh, Marlene then to, to help us think yeah. about yeah. the ways in which um, literature and culture in South Africa have been mm -hmm. shifted racially since 1994. Uh, there's a lot to think about. I never thought that the post-racial idea was real. It sort of seemed like fantasy to me. Um, a good fantasy, a good dream, but not real. Um, the election of Barack Obama... <clears throat> Our second black president. <laughs> I didn't mean... <laughs> I said they treated him like a black man. Yes, yes. Anyway, uh, the, the election of Barack Obama was a, an occasion for two things. One, a conversation about the possibility of post-racial. It also was the possibility of extremely you know, racist, not just racial, commentary. Uh, even though everybody knows that none of that applies the human race started in Africa, everybody knows that, that there is no such thing as a Mexican race. or I mean, these things just don't exist, biologically, scientifically, the separation of people. But there are cultural and, you know, and ethnic differences. And the differences may, don't have to be you know, pulled together in a big melting pot. It's a question of hierarchy, not difference. It's, hierarchy, that's the problem and the solution. But I find now that there's really no way to talk about it. I mean, the language <laughs> that is at our disposal to talk about race uh, is, um, is destructive and, and limiting and it, closed, it shuts doors. When I wrote that uh, story that you mentioned called Recitative, and I was very careful not to identify the race of either of those girls and at all. Just use cultural clues if anybody was interested. And I repeated that again in uh, Paradise. Yeah. And to have those four women. But the signal race in the beginning, they shot the white girl first. So you know one person is white. But not to let the reader not to use the obvious language of race there. So, nobody knows who the white girl is, or they think they do. When I read reviews, I always go, ha, ha, ha. they don't know. <laughs> but but the, it wasn't so much to be tricky as to really see whether I could do actually what uh, Ms. Eukert does without having it as a goal, which is to write long, to write without racist and racial language. You know, to, to get rid of all of the signals and to write as much as I could about each of those girls in the convent in paradise so that you know everything about them, everything about them except that. That's the one thing you don't know is which one is black and which one is white. And I was trying to say, that's the least important information you've got about a human being. That is the least. When I walk down the street and I see a black person or <laughs> a white person, I don't know anything. I mean, I may assert some things, but 
depending on other things, but that's not knowledge. That's not penetration of a personality or a human being. You don't know what they're going to say. But we're using that more and more and more, as you know, you know now in this country, uh, trying to distinguish A from B and B from C and who belongs and who doesn't. And belonging is very important to Americans because, you know, except for the original people, not, none of us was born here. I mean, none of us. We were all from some other place. We're all, in that sense, immigrants. And the other rather extraordinary thing, I think, uh, along with uh, these dis racial distinctions getting sliced, you know, thinner and thinner and thinner, is this fear. I mean, why is everybody walking around with a gun? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not a sign of, of um, being brave. It's just the opposite, it seems to me. We're coming with our gun. Why? Well, maybe one or two others. But anyway, I'm, I know I've changed my answer to move into other areas, but I can't bear it any longer. And I've tried in two instances in my work to see what it's like when you don't use the language that we thrown at us and the code language that we use in order to identify as well as demonize race, racial difference. Yes, I, I listen with... Um with great interest to this, um, South Africa is still an extremely racialized society. Uh, public discourse is studded with terms like black economic empowerment. Um, in the census, when we have to fill in the census, we still have to indicate white, black, colored, whatever. Yeah? So, um, and recently I read a very interesting analysis by a black commentator, a journalist, who said that in certain circles, in certain black circles, I, I, I do this to illustrate to you how racialized the public discourse is, that um, black people would refer to other black people as behaving in a white way, <laughs> etc. So, so, I mean, this is still very much part of a, an extremely touchy and mobilized kind of weighting of words around race in, uh, in South Africa. Um, lots of other things hang together with that. Um, I want to refer to a book of a countryman that had just come out. I don't know whether you've heard of it. It's called Native Nostalgia, rather interestingly, by Jacob Dlamini. And um, with reference to all kinds of um, uh, uh, fashionable, not meant in a negative way, theorists, you know, Benjamin and De Sato and so on, Dlamini writes from a black perspective about his life in a township and the way in which black people were vibrant and alive and culturally active in the days of apartheid. Now, of course, the first thing that happens to a book like this is that right-wing white journalists jump on it and say, look, look, they did have a life. <laughs> you know, and one, one feels very ashamed of that kind of reaction. This is not why I have it here, obviously. But what is interesting to me is that Jacob makes a case for... Um, the criticism of the orthodox story, the orthodox story told by the ANC about victimhood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he is quite clever and quite succinct in his, um, how shall I say, rejection of the notion of victim. Mm -hmm. Also in writing about his own youth in the township, during which he uses a lot of, how shall I say, appreciative terms of a certain pride that is reminiscent of the way in which Steve Biko talked about blackness in South Africa. So I think a lot of work um, still has to be done by young black um, writers to, I say, resuscitate the spirit of Biko in a way and reclaim for themselves um, 
a kind of cultural dignity in, instead of going with the flow of the ANC's um, uh, victim story. Um, and I don't mean this that people are not victims. It is a fact that in South Africa, only 11% of the total population earn more than 2,000 rand a month. How much does that come down to in dollars? Uh, about two, 200? 200, something like that. Only 11, only 11 percent of the total population in South Africa, more than $200 a month. So that shows you how apartheid has made victims. In the 40 years of its reigns, it has made, of its reign, its reign it, it did make victims. And people are caught in spirals of poverty and lack of ed education and illiteracy and so on and so forth. And so one doesn't want to diminish the damage that was done at all, at all. Uh, at the same time, I think it's inspiring to read someone like uh, Dlamini, who's doing a PhD in history at, um, at Oxford or at Harvard somewhere. And I, think it's a, I think it's Yale, but, uh, uh, Yale. but let's, let's, oh, <laughs> let's, let's not focus on the details. Um, but Anyhow. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, yes. uh, but sorry, we have... Carry on no, 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 that's extremely interesting. And I think it's good to end our discussion at this Penn World Voices Festival with the celebration of the work of a new, young uh, writer, theorist, who comes to us, from, in this case, from South Africa, uh, uh, in the name and in the voice of a, of a wonderful uh, South African writer whose work, I hope, we've uh, helped people to come to know a little bit better. Uh, and I'd like to thank very much both of these two wonderful writers for talking to us today.